Hi, welcome to another episode of Composing Tips, the Media Composer podcast. I'm Nico, and today I'm starting a new series on orchestration. In this episode, we will start with a very simple orchestral climax. No special effects, no synth, no over-the-top percussion. No 48 horns section screaming, no huge taikos blasting, just the old regular classic orchestra. As some listeners of the podcast asked me to make my projects downloadable, you can also get the MIDI for the project in this episode at composingtips.com. It's all free, don't worry. So, this is what we are going to do, step by step. We will start with this. And we will work our way until we have this. Let's get to it then. First of all, I hear you asking, but Nico, what library should I use? Well, glad you asked. The answer is simple. Whatever orchestral library that you have will do the job just fine. For this example, I went for an all-in-one package. I've used the Berkeley Berlin Orchestra by Orchestral Tools. You know this uh, subset of libraries of the Berlin series libraries that they developed for the Berkeley students. I simply took that one because there is already all the instruments that I would need in it. They are already balanced and I would not have to worry about mixing and blending different rooms together. But really, whatever you have will do the job, whether it is Spitfire BBCSO, Audio Imperia Nucleus, the East-West Hollywood Orchestra, or VSL Synchron Prime, or even if you want to mix and match libraries from different vendors, it doesn't matter. That's not the focus of this episode. With that out of the way, there is another consideration that we need to keep in mind. Say that you have, for example, two very tall people standing next to each other. You picture them, two very tall people like, say, Michael Jordan and uh, Magic Johnson standing up next to each other. Both of them will look tall, sure. But now try to imagine a small person standing next to a tall person. The tall person will look even taller. Well, in music, we do the same and we call this contrast. Another contrast example that I can give you is this. Imagine a black square, just a simple plain black square. Picture it in your mind. Now, imagine this black square in the center of a larger gray square. You see it? Yeah? Okay. The black square will look even darker because of the contrast brought by the gray one around it. This is why in the previous example that I have just played to you, we have eight bars of lead-in to the climax. The lead-in is quieter, less full, and three half tones lower than the climax itself. I will show you how to do it step by step, but first we will concentrate on the climax itself. First of all, if we want to orchestrate a climax, well, we need something to orchestrate. Anything, really. So, I made a three notes piano motif. 
Really simple. Three notes. It's just to have something to start with. I then developed this simple motif by simply copy-pasting it onto the three next bars. For each bar, I moved the notes around, but I kept the same rhythm. Right? So, structure of the note, length of the note is the same, but I move them around a bit. In the last bar, I modified the rhythm a little bit. Again, nothing complicated to it. Here's the full developed melody on four bars. Because I want each first note of each bar to really cut through, you know, like BAM, BAM, BAM. I started the melody on the second beat of each bar. Here is the same melody, but this time with the metronome, so that you can hear what I mean by saying I start the melody on the second beat. This way, I can make sure of two things when we will orchestrate. First, I can put some really heavy stuff on the first beat of each bar, like percussion hits, marcato notes, and so on. Like, you know, really to, to mark the, the, the beginning of each bar, but I don't want it to clash with the melody, because the melody will really shine when it starts. First, we have the BAM! Here we are! I'm about to say something. And then, with the melody, we say what we want to say and capture the listener's attention. Right, moving on. We also need some harmony to work with, as we won't just orchestrate a melody on its own, right? We are in the scale of the minor, because we all know by now that you cannot do epic if you are not in the minor. This was told by some German composer who had a moderate success scoring some small independent movies. The minor. Here, you can really do whatever you want, as long as your chords are in the scale and that they fit with your melody. Basic triads. So, triads, three note chords. And I doubled the root of the chord in the bass. Nothing fancy. No added sevenths or diminished chords or, you know, just your old regular triads. Let's keep it simple for this example. But if you are following along and doing your own thing as you are listening, feel free to go wild. Personally, I just want to keep it simple for the example. So here is the harmony. You notice that in the last bar, I've used two chords instead of just one. This way, the whole climax gets a bit more interesting as it goes bam, 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 bam. Just a little surprise for our listeners right at the end. And that's that. We have something to work with. It doesn't sound like much, but hey, that's why we are here, to make it better. So, where should we start now? Some people, they will go with the rhythm. Some others, they will go with the bass first or the harmony. But personally, I like to go with the melody first. I always start with the melody when I orchestrate. If the bass is the foundation on which you build something, I like to think of the melody as the message. It's really 
what we want to say and what we want to be heard. So to me, it makes sense to focus first on the melody, making it shine before we color around it to give it even more emphasis. So right here, we are in the realm of epicness. And quick, what is the most epic section that you can think of in the orchestra? If you just thought about the harp or the glockenspiel, you may want to revisit this whole epic concept a little bit. My first thought was French horns, the big, bold French horns. So let's do this. Let's play the melody with four horns between about forte and fortissimo. You know, they will blast their lungs off. We want them to be heard and to lead and drive the whole piece. Notice how each first note is a marcato. We want the melody to be marked and powerful. Marked, hands, marcato. Don't just use one articulation when you are writing. It will make your track sound dull. Here, alternating between marcato and legato gives us a bit of movement. It's not flat. It may sound a bit weird on its own, but hey, we, we are still building. For, for, for now, we just made the first line in our piece. To mark the melody even more, we will fill the higher register of the frequency spectrum by doubling it with violins. The violins one and the violins two playing one octave apart from each other, and one octave higher than the horns. Just the violins, they sound like this. And now, the violins and the horns that sounds like this. The melody is our main message. So let's continue to layer things to really make it as prominent as we can. Same as I did with the violins one and two, I will do the same with a flute and a piccolo flute. So the small flute that is really shrill and destroy your ears. In the whole arrangement, it will be more felt than heard. But I assure you that if you remove them, you will notice a drop in power. It's the combination of all these little things that will make our climax soar. Here is the melody with flute and piccolo one octave apart. And now with the rest, I told you, this is more felt than heard, but it definitely reinforces the frequency spectrum and fills it even more than with just the horns and the violins. And because we are going to add a lot of instruments to this climax, it's really important to keep it balanced. I think that for now, we are good with our melody. The message is written.
So now we need to wrap this message into a nice package. At this point, I like to take care of the baseline. By having the baseline done and the melody as well, we will then have a clear picture of what we need to fill in the register with the harmony. To start with the baseline, I will use a single tuba. Again, pay attention to the articulations that uh, you are using to make your line more lively. Here, I alternate between marcato, staccato, and staccatissimo. Here is the tuba on its own. Okay, granted, it sounds a little bit weird on its own. It's not the kind of sound that we, <laughs> we are used to listen to in isolation. Sorry if you are a tuba player, but that's just the way it is. I am not going to a concert of a solo tuba. Anyway, both the rhythm and articulations that we are going to double with the other instruments until we have a full and powerful bass line is here. Notice how the first note of each bar is really marked. It doesn't start soft at all. When I told you earlier that the melody starts on beat 2, well, it's exactly the reason. We first hear the marked note before leaving space for the melody. As for the harmony part of it, here, we are just playing the root of each chord. There is no inversion, no melodic line. It's just one note with the rhythm that I chose for the bass line. And the whole bass line will be built on that. While we are in the wind instruments, and here in my template, I have my brass loaded in the center of my screen, let's double our tuba with a bass trombone. Here, they will both play in the same register, on the same octave. But where the tuba has a rounder bottom, the bass trombone has a sizzle in the higher frequencies. It's nearly harsh to the ear. And I have to confess that I don't really like the sound of a bass trombone on its own. But here, let's listen to the tuba and the bass trombone playing together. All right, let's continue with wind instruments. In the woodwinds now, we will double the tuba with two bassoons. We will double these bassoons with the bass clarinet as well. And we will also use the lowest instrument in this track, a contrabassoon. The contrabassoon is even going to play one octave lower than the rest, giving it this large bottom foundation that we need. Here is the low woodwind section playing the same line together. And now we play that together with the low brass. Again, we are in the domain of more felt than heard, but you will notice how fuller our bass line now sounds. As I said before, I really want each first note to be very, very marked. That's, you know, it's epic. It, it needs to blast. That's why we are going to emphasize the hit of each note with some percussion. 
For that, I will double everything with both a timpani and a bass drum. For the last bar, the timpani is going to provide rolls rather than just single hits. This will also help to signal to the listener that we are reaching the end of the phrase. Hear how more powerful our line sounds now, now that we added those two percussive instruments. I also want this bass line to be ominous. It's there, it's not going anywhere, and it needs to bring some kind of feeling of seriousness or gravitas to the whole piece. There is an instrument in the tonal percussion section that is just perfectly suited for that, the tubular bells. I absolutely love tubular bells, and sometimes I think that I should hold off a bit from using them everywhere. But anyway, here is what we have now. Let's move on to the low strings. I know that some people like to start with strings, but I prefer to take care of them at the end when the bass line is concerned. It prevents me from starting too loud with the low strings and then having no more headroom for the brass, because the brass is loud. We will still keep it very simple. Both the double basses and the cellos, or celli, are going to play the same line one octave apart. Let's just hear them in isolation because I really enjoy basses and cellos playing together. That's it for baseline. I think it is now complete. Let's hear it with all the bass instrument playing. We have our melody. We have our bass line orchestrated, yay! But how do they sound together? That's usually when I take care of, touch, uh, of touching up a little bit on the dynamics. Maybe the bass needs a bit more power here, or the melody needs to be tamed at this bar, or whatever. No, no. This is what you control with dynamics and expression, respectively CC1 and CC11. Even if this is not mixing, it goes already a long way in achieving a clear and powerful mix in a later stage. So here is what we have so far. Okay, now it starts to sound like something. We are not finished though, because we have a big hole to fill in the mid frequencies. And we also need to give some more information to our listeners about where this is all going. We do this with harmony, or chords, if we want to keep it simple. Harmony, chords, not the same, but let's, in this example, let's use these terms interchangeably. If we look at all the sections that we already used, we still have some 
that don't yet play a part. We have the trombones, for example. A regular orchestral trombone section is made of two tenor trombones, sometimes three, and one bass trombone. But we already used the bass trombone, so we will work with the two tenor ones. They will just play long notes to fill in the spectrum between the bass and the horn melody. Trombone one is going to play the root note of each chord, simple, and trombone two is going to play the fifth, simple as well. Only legato lines. This is what they are going to do. Notice the dynamic changes throughout the phrase? You really want to play with CC1 here and make it not flat. Because we only have the root and the fifth of each chord, we also need to fill in the third. That's the note, the super important note in a chord that will tell us if we have a major or a minor chord. Let's find another section that could take care of this. Well, we have the trumpets, and the trumpets and the trombones are related. They sound good together. And this is perfect as well, because they will play above the horn, while the trombones, they play below the horns. We have a nice brass sandwich with the melody right there in the middle. I have here in this library three solo trumpets. This means that I can use three notes for each chord. So we can do the whole triad here. One is playing the root, one is playing the third, and the last one is playing the fifth. Added to our trombones, we have chords spread on five notes. We double the root, we double the fifth, and we have one third, which is kind of a classic way to voice a chord. In total, we still have more roots than fifth because we also have the basses. Remember those basses we just spent some time on? Yeah, the bass trombone, tuba and all. Okay, these are all doubling of the roots. So here are the trumpets with the trombones. If we just take a look at what we have now, we can see that the brass section fills everything. We have bass, harmony, melody. And for the sake of completeness, let's listen to the brass section on its own, and you will see that everything makes sense together. And now let's play everything together before we move on to adding some textures, short strings and candy on top of it all. It sounds full. I like it so far. Are you still with me? Okay, good. Because we need to make all of this moving a bit more. And for that, we are going to introduce a small melodic and rhythmic texture to the sauce. We will take the violins, the violas, and the cellos. Because violins and cellos are already playing in this piece, we will make a second section of them. We call this a divisi. 
It's when a section is divided into subgroups and they play different things. I didn't overcomplicate this. I've just duplicated the second violins and the cellos. I didn't use another library. Uh, I didn't mix it differently. Uh, you know, I just doubled them from the same library. I can because they, they are going to play different stuff. And that's the whole point of a divisi. They will each play short notes using a spiccato articulation. They will simply go up and down in each chord. They will be moving swiftly. I could have chosen a more complex rhythmic pattern, but again, I just wanted to keep it simple. So up we go, and then down, and then up, and then down. Each section is playing again an octave, a part with the violins at the top and the cellos at the bottom. This is the result. Okay, a quick digression here. I absolutely love this slight version of the Berlin Orchestra. But somehow, I am not that of a big fan of the short strings. They sound much, much better in the full Berlin Strings library. Anyway, that's what we have, and we will not let it prevent us from writing music. Be mindful of varying your velocities, or this will sound robotic. Mark the beats with stronger velocities, and so on and so forth. Not everything at velocity 100, for example, you know, have some, <laughs> have a bit of uh, differences in there. This rhythmic part, I think that we can enhance it with a flute, an oboe, an English horn, and a clarinet, just to make it pop more within, in the context of the whole ensemble. The woodwinds here, they will just double their string counterparts. This is what we get, the strings plus the woodwinds. This gives us a bit more clarity and fatness, for a lack of a better word. But, you know, again, it's all these little things that add up, so they are important. But I still feel it's a bit too heavy in the mid-range, and it doesn't shine enough on the higher frequencies. This is something that we could absolutely take care of in the mix, but I will not. Instead, I will deal with it right now with orchestration, and I will do that by adding one more layer at the very top. A glockenspiel will do the trick. Here. Yep, that works. And yes, the glockenspiel is not playing the whole up and down, up and down, up and down. Because I tried it at first and I found it a little bit too tiring on the ear. It's high, it's piercing, so just up, down, wait, up, down, wait. And this is what we have so far in total. And now we are at the very last part. This is what I always do at the end. It's adding some percussion. I, I, I am a strong proponent that a piece of music should 
work and hold its own without percussion. If the percussion holds the piece of music together, maybe it's not that well orchestrated. But at the end, I like to add some on top of it. It's like sprinkling candy on an already good cake. To highlight the rhythm and choose how the piece will drive the listener, that, that's really the goal. But here, I've kept it really, really simple. I've added one single snare drum. I doubled it with toms, a little shaker on top, you know, the tss -tss thing, and uh, two cymbal rolls, one in the middle, one at the end, nothing else. This is what our percussion section now sounds like together with the timpani and the bass drum. And that's it. We have our orchestral climax. Let's hear it with everything that we've put into. Go back to our piano example and compare it with what we have now. We made it sound good, don't you agree? Before we part, I will show you a little trick to make your climax pop more inside your track. I said it at the beginning, if we contrast it with something smaller, your climax will sound even bigger. So here is what I have done. I've made a small lead in to the climax. I copied the long strings with the melody and I added that before the climax. In this melody, I removed one note out of two. So every two notes, I removed it. Not to give away the message just now, just to give a hint of the message of what we are about to say. Also, the violins are not playing in octave anymore. They play in unison. I've done the same with the short strings and I lowered the dynamics. A little bit so they are not as loud as in the climax. I've also copied the trombone harmony and the tuba for the bass and again I dropped the dynamics by nearly half so if in the climax the peak of CC1 was around value 9500 here it's around 4550. I've also copied the shaker part so that we have a sense of driving and continuity in the rhythm between the lead-in and the climax. I've only added one instrument that is not in the climax, chimes. Just, you know, these little magical bells that will complete the lead into the climax. We go like so small bells and bam, here comes the climax. And if you remember the analogy of the gray square with the black square in the middle, I've also dropped this lead in by three half tones lower. That's now how everything sounds with the lead in at the beginning. And now we are done and I can take my leave until the next episode. As usual, thank you for listening. I hope it was helpful. And don't forget that the MIDI for this 
project is available for download on composingtips.com. That's just in case you want to try it with another library or if you want to look at the dynamics or check how I did the, I don't know, the CC11 or the velocities on the short notes. With that said, you can now go and write some great music. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? Do you want more content? So head over to ComposingTips.com and join the community there. You will find more episodes, videos, project files, as well as a forum where you will be able to connect with like-minded people. It's all free, so register today on ComposingTips.com. <laughs>